the Son, the Father, and the Holy Spirit. This is the Trinity, one of the most interesting and highly debated doctrines in all of Christianity. God in three parts. From its conception, there have been many disagreements on the nature of Christ, things concerning his divinity and his relationship to God. The modern view of the Trinity is one of the most mysterious and incomprehensible doctrines in Christianity. Was Jesus God? Was Jesus possessed by God's Spirit? Were Jesus and God two separate but equal beings? Was Jesus human? Was Jesus a prophet? These questions have plagued Christianity since its conception. This doctrine is the untouchable doctrine of Christianity, and it continues to become more complicated as time goes on. Why is this? What were the early Christian ideas? What contentions were brought up? And how have these ideas changed over time? These are just some of the questions I set out to answer in this video. Erasmus, circa 1520. Our mystery story begins with the Dutch theologian Erasmus, who published the first Greek version of the New Testament in 1516. He based his version on some very unreliable Greek manuscripts. The ones he used contained the story in John about the woman taken in adultery. It also contained the last 12 verses of Mark, the infamous longer ending. Both of these passages were not in the original text of these writings. It's no surprise that Erasmus was basing his version on these bad manuscripts, however, because they were simply the only ones he had access to. One passage that Erasmus's Greek text left out, however, got the attention of some very prominent theologians. For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. And there are three that bear witness in earth, the Spirit, and the water, and the blood, and these three agree in one. 1 John 5, 7 to 8. This is the infamous Johannine comma, and it played a large role in the way the Trinity, and for that matter, Christianity, evolved. One of his opponents was Stunica, who went public in his defamation of Erasmus. As the story goes, Erasmus said he would rewrite the text with the passage included if someone could produce a Greek manuscript that included it. So, instead of being honest, the theologians literally produced a Greek manuscript themselves just so Erasmus would include the passage in his next translation. The text itself is preserved and has been incredibly well kept except the pages containing 1 John 5. The passage has been looked at so much over the years that the pages have been soiled by repeated examinations. Erasmus's second edition, published in 1519, included the Johannine comma, and his text would become the Textus Receptus, or received text. It was used as the basis to write the King James Bible. But why was it so important to these theologians that the Johannine comma be included in the text? It was the only passage in the New Testament that explicitly taught the doctrine of the Trinity. Without it, readers would be left to figure out something triune doctrine-like from other verses in the New Testament. Modern scholars are generally convinced this passage is a later edition, but I won't go over that too much in depth here. I will, however, be discussing it in depth in a future video. But for now, we need to discuss why it was so important that this verse be in the text. For this, we have to go back in time to earliest Christianity and discuss the differing views on the divinity of Christ. Adoptionism, circa 75. Since the writing of the Gospel of Mark, one popular view of the nature of Christ was adoptionism. The view of the adoptionist was that Jesus was fully human, just like anyone else. The difference, however, was how observant he was of the Jewish law. Because of this, in their view, God adopted Jesus at his baptism. To them, Jesus was not the Son of God in the literal sense, but in the adopted sense. Their argument is supported by the entirety of Mark's Gospel. Mark begins with calling Jesus the Son of God in Mark 1.1, but this has long been known to be a later edition. Excluding this, the first time Jesus is referred to as God's Son is during his baptism. We can see this in Mark 1.11. Right after Jesus' baptism, the Holy Spirit descended, and Jesus heard, You are my beloved Son, with you I am well pleased. This is followed by the temptation narrative. What exactly could Satan offer God himself? The story would only be meaningful as a lesson if Jesus was not God. The adoptionist reasoned that Jesus was then a human whom God had taken under his wing. Likewise, Mark's Jesus has no problem differentiating himself from God which is shown in Mark 10.18. 
Why do you call me good? No one is good but God alone. This view was also supported by the fact that Jesus wasn't omniscient. For example, in Mark 13.32, Jesus is ignorant of the future. But of that day and hour no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Scribes were so confused and stunned by this passage that some actually removed the phrase, nor the Son. Later Christian writings also seem to support this view in one way or another. For example, in Acts and in Luke. We tell you the good news, what God promised our ancestors he has fulfilled for us, their children, by raising up Jesus, as it is written in the second psalm, You are my son, today I have begotten you. Acts 13, 32-33 In this text, the day Jesus became begotten as God's son was the day of the resurrection. But how does that square with what Luke says elsewhere? In Luke's Gospel, the voice utters the same words, You are my son, today I have begotten you, Luke 3.22, when Jesus is baptized. But even earlier, the angel Gabriel announced to Mary, prior to Jesus' conception and birth, that the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be holy. He will be called the Son of God, Luke 1.35. In this instance, it appears that Jesus is the Son of God because of the virginal conception. He is physically God's Son. How can Luke say all three things? I'm not sure it's possible to reconcile these accounts. It may be that Luke got these different traditions from different sources that disagreed with one another on the issue. This view would eventually be deemed heresy, as we will see later in this video. We now move on even later into the first century with the advent of Docetism. Docetism, circa 90. With so many views on the nature of Christ beginning to spring up, it only makes sense that the Docetists would become a deciding factor in how the evolution of the Trinity would play out. Docetism comes from the Greek word dokeo, meaning appeared. The Docetists believe that Jesus was merely an illusion, a phantasm, who only seemed to live and die. The term Docetist was not a name this group gave to themselves, rather a slur, similar to heathen or infidel as a term for non-believers. This view garnered a lot of support in early Christianity, just as much as the adoptionist view, if not more. The Docetist's main contention was that if Jesus were fully divine, he could not suffer, and if he could suffer, he was not fully divine. Seems like a reasonable conclusion. But this phantasm of a Jesus was only one Docetic view. There existed another that is a bit more complicated, it maintained that there was a real man Jesus, a flesh and blood human like the rest of us. But there was also a different being known as the Christ. The Christ was a divine being who descended from heaven and came into Jesus at his baptism. Empowering him, and before Jesus died, the Christ left him to return to its heavenly home. Similar to the adoptionist view, they argued that the dove that descended from heaven at Jesus' baptism was the divine being entering him. Then, while he's dying on the cross, the divine being leaves him, and Jesus cries out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Or, more literally, My God, my God, why have you abandoned me? Some of Paul's writings even supported this view. In Romans 8.3, Paul writes that the Son came in the likeness of flesh. To the Docetists, this was the reason there were no stories written about Jesus' infancy, his childhood, or while he was a young adult. This view persisted for centuries until it was eventually declared a heresy. When Docetism saw its apex in the 2nd century, some of its followers started writing their own Gospels. This included the Gospel of Peter, the Gospel of Judas, the Gospel of Philip, the Acts of John, and many more. Later in this video, we will discuss their exclusion from what we now know to be the Biblical canon. The specific texts I listed are some of the ones that espoused a Docetic view. Docetism was not something to be tolerated, so proto-Orthodox Christians, that being the sect of Christians that would become the Orthodoxy, began writing their own Gospels, Acts, and every other kind of writing under the sun to combat these Docetic views. 1 John specifically was written against them, as can be seen in 1 John 4, 2-3. This is how you can recognize the Spirit of God. Every spirit that acknowledges that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God, but every spirit that does not acknowledge Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, 
which you have heard is coming and even now is already in the world. John is making it very clear that there are those who do not think Jesus came in the flesh, even going so far as to call them antichrists. Tensions were rising in the early days of Christianity, and we can still see its aftermath. The debate would rage on for centuries, however, and the arguments would only get more and more heated. This early, we already see docetic texts being written and proto-orthodox texts to combat them. A back and forth that would change everything. Marcionism, circa 140. At the end of July, 144 CE, a hearing took place before the clergy of the Christian congregations in Rome. Marcion, the son of the Bishop of Sinope, stood before the presbyters to expound his teachings in order to win others to his point of view. For some years, he had been a member of one of the Roman churches and had proved the sincerity of his faith by making relatively large contributions. No doubt he was a respected member of the Christian community, but what he now expounded to the presbyters was so monstrous that they were utterly shocked. The hearing ended in a harsh rejection of Marcion's views, and he was formally excommunicated. But why? Were Marcion's views really so harmful that the church wanted to have nothing to do with him? Apparently so. When it comes to the Trinitarian controversy, Marcion's views brought a lot to the table that the Proto-Orthodoxy would have to deal with. So what were his views? Marcion wrote a single work, Antithesis, Contradictions, in which he set forth his ideas. Since it has not been preserved, we must be content with deducing its contents from the writings of his opponents, particularly in Tertullian's Against Marcion. The main points of Marcion's teachings were the rejection of the Old Testament and a distinction between the supreme God of goodness and an inferior God of justice, who was the creator and God of the Jews. He regarded Christ as a second God. The Old and New Testament gods, Marcion argued, cannot be reconciled with each other. The code of conduct advocated by Moses was an eye for an eye, but Christ set this precept aside. Elisha had had children eaten by bears. Christ said, let the little children come to me. Joshua had stopped the sun in its path in order to continue the slaughter of his enemies. Paul quoted Christ as commanding, let not the sun go down on your wrath. In the Old Testament, divorce was permitted and so was polygamy, but in the New Testament, neither is allowed. Moses enforced the Jewish Sabbath and law. Christ has freed believers from both. Even within the Old Testament, Marcion found contradictions. God commanded that no work should be done on the Sabbath, yet he told the Israelites to carry the ark around Jericho seven times on the Sabbath. No graven images were to be made, yet Moses was directed to fashion a bronze serpent. The deity revealed in the Old Testament could not have been omniscient, otherwise he would not have asked, Adam, where are you? in Genesis 3.9. The God of the Old Testament was an unjust, genocidal, megalomaniacal bully, and the God of the New Testament was a kind, loving, and forgiving God. To Marcion, this could not be the same God. So there must have been two gods, one evil one and one good one who came to save us. There were many church fathers that wrote against Marcion in the following years, but after the hearing in 144, Marcion's church in Rome kept growing. He even had his own canon. Before Marcion, the only scripture Christians were talking about was the Septuagint. Now they had Marcion's canon to reference. His canon included something similar to the Gospel of Luke and many of Paul's letters. We now have many views on Jesus and his divinity, but we are still a long way from the orthodox view. Maybe Jesus was an illusion, a reflection of the true reality. Perhaps there were two gods, a good one and an evil one. Or maybe Jesus was a human possessed by the Holy Spirit. None of these views would win out, however. Modalism and Montanism, circa 210. After the polemics that ensued in the 1st and 2nd centuries, the Proto-Orthodox had to combat all the views they deemed as heresy. It is worth noting that the views that ultimately developed were necessarily paradoxical in nature. Is Jesus God or man? Both. If Jesus is God and his Father is God, are there two gods? No, there's one. Why the paradoxes? Because the proto-Orthodox Christians had to fight adoptionists on one side and the docetists on the other side, Marcion on one side, and Gnostics on the other, and so on. The earliest view that somewhat resembled our modern view was modalism. Modalism suggested that God was the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit all in one, but God would appear in different modes. Think of it this way. You can be a father, a son, 
and a brother. They would be the son to their father, the father to their son, and a brother to their sister. In the same way, God was the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. This view was fairly popular, but it had another opponent aside from the Gnostic groups. That view was Montanism, a similar view whose followers had a lot of choice words for modalists. Tertullian thought this view was laughable, and he makes his point very clear with some 21st century atheist-like ribbing. The Father said to the Son, Thou art my Son, this day I have begotten thee. If you want me to believe him to be both the Father and the Son, show me some other passage where it is declared, The Lord said unto himself, I am my own Son, today I have begotten myself. It's clear he had some issues with the modalist view. Tertullian believes that all real things are material. God is a spirit, but a spirit is a material thing made out of a finer sort of matter. At the beginning, God is alone, though he has his own reason within him. Then, when it is time to create, he brings the sun into existence, using but not losing a portion of his spiritual matter. Then the sun, using a portion of the divine matter shared with him, brings into existence the spirit. And the two of them are God's instruments, his agents, in the creation and governance of the cosmos. The sun, on this theory, is not God himself, nor is he divine in the same sense that the Father is divine. Rather, the Son is divine in that he is made of a portion of the matter that the Father is composed of. This makes them one substance, or not different as to essence. But the Son isn't the same God as the Father, though he can be called God because of what he's made out of. Nor is there any tri-personal God here, but only a tri-personal portion of matter, the smallest portion shared by all three. The one God is sharing a portion of his stuff with another, by causing another to exist out of it. And then this other turns around and does likewise, sharing some of this matter with a third. Another problem with the modalist view is that if you're the son of a father, you can't be the father that you're the son of. They had to be different. Jesus prays to God multiple times, but he wasn't just talking to himself. But Montanism had its own problems as well. They were a prophetic movement, making it easily exploitable. The church fathers realized the danger of receiving direct revelation from God and not scripture, so this Montanist view, along with the modalist view, were deemed heresy. Arianism, circa 310. We now arrive to the early 4th century. The Trinity doctrine had been in progress for over 200 years, but even now there seemed to be no end in sight. Here we see the rise of Arianism and the Arian controversy. One of the main problems of the early church was dealing with the Platonic view on the nature of God. Plato viewed God as eternal and unknowable. But if that were true, Jesus wouldn't be God in the same sense, because they were convinced they did know him. Moreover, since the Father is indivisible, he could not have created the Son out of himself. If the Son was created before all things, it would logically follow that he was created out of nothing. This sparked a major debate in Alexandria that would be a deciding factor in the current state of the Trinitarian doctrine. There came along someone named Arius, and his philosophy became very popular in Alexandria. Arius shared a similar view on the Trinity as Origen did, but he was much more articulate about it. Here, then, was Arius' Christ, inferior or subordinate to the Father, and created by the Father out of nothing. Arius was not merely preoccupied with logic, however. He also argued from an emotional standpoint. He presents a savior who was more human, more like his followers, and actually participated in human struggles towards virtue. His Christ was a creation of God, just like everybody else. Whatever his motives, by around 320 he had provoked an infuriated opposition in Alexandria, including its bishop, Alexander. Alexander examined and excommunicated Arius. Numerous churchmen, adhering to subordinationist traditions about the Son, rallied to Arius' side, while others, favoring theologies holding to the external existence of the Son and his ontological equality with the Father, joined his opponents. The dispute threatened to split the church, and a series of councils ensued, variously excommunicating and vindicating Arius and his defenders, or their opponents. Each side successively tried to win the favor of the then-current emperor, trying to manipulate imperial power to crush its opposition. The first of these councils has been immortalized in fiction novels, the Council of Nicaea. 
This is where they decided what was officially heresy and what was officially orthodoxy. Here they condemned views of adoptionism, docetism, Arianism, and many more. They discussed liturgical practice, the celebration of Easter, and some other issues. One of the projects undertaken by the Council was the creation of a creed, a declaration and summary of the Christian faith. This wouldn't be the end of the evolution of Christianity, however. There were still many battles to be fought. Note that these are formulated against specific heretical views. For example, I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in his one Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. These formulations were made not simply because they sounded good, but because there were other groups of Christians that disagreed with them, who thought, for example, that there was more than one God, that the true God was not the Creator, that Jesus was not the Creator's Son, that Jesus was two beings, not one, and so on. The result is the highly paradoxical affirmations of faith that have come down to the present day about God who is the creator of all things, but not of evil and suffering found in all things, and of Jesus who is both completely human and completely divine, not half of one or the other, but who is only one being, not two, and of the Father, the Son, and the Spirit as three separate beings that make up only one God. Augustine circa 420. We now enter the early 5th century. Just over a decade earlier, Augustine of Hippo converted to Christianity at the age of 31. His conversion was due to his studies in religion and Neoplatonism. If you would like to learn more about Platonism and Neoplatonism, be sure to check out our newest armchair philosophy video on the subject. Augustine was probably the most influential Christian thinker in the West until Aquinas, and his views were widely held. Augustine was the next stepping stone in the Trinity doctrine. At this time, there was still a lingering sense of Arianism, even though it was considered heretical. In response to this fact, he wrote a book entitled On the Trinity, a book which has been researched and referenced countless times by later theologians. He had no idea about the Trinitarian conflict that had been going on for centuries, but he was prepared to defend this doctrine. Augustine saw the image of the Trinity within humanity. Father, Son, and Spirit could be represented by three aspects of human consciousness. The mind itself, its knowledge which is at once its offspring and self-derived word, and thirdly, love. These three are one and one single substance. The mind is no greater than its offspring, when its self-knowledge is equal to its being, nor than its love, when its self-love is equal to its knowledge and to its being. To Augustine, the Father was memory, the Son was understanding, and the Spirit was will. He saw these all to be different aspects of the same substance. Since the Council of Nicaea, the understanding of son to father was described like a physical son to a parent, begotten of the father. This raised the same problem that previous theologians had. They had to justify equal rather than subordinate status of the spirit within the Trinity. Augustine decided that it would be wise to preserve the spirit's equality by asserting that the son participated in the formation of the spirit. Although he had stated the Spirit proceeds from the Father. His opponents argued that it should say the Spirit proceeded from the Father and the Son. This may seem like splitting hairs, but this would eventually divide the imperial church. The West eventually agreed that this alteration should be made to the Creed, but the East would soon see it as an offense. Athanasian Creed, circa 500. We have already covered Arius and Arianism. But there was an important person in the Council of Nicaea in 325 that we didn't discuss, Athanasius. He was the one opposing Arianism, and his arguments won out. In the early 6th century, a creed was written that embodied the ideas of Athanasius. Contemporary philosophical discussions often begin with this creed, and it puts pro-Nicene Trinitarianism into a memorably short and palpably paradoxical form. If you would like to see the whole creed, it is found in the description below. It's lengthy, so I will go over its important aspects. We worship one God in Trinity, and the Trinity in unity, neither confusing the persons nor dividing the divine being. For the Father is one person, the Son is another, and the Spirit is still another. But the deity of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is one, equal in glory, co-eternal in majesty. What the Father is, the Son is, and so is the Holy Spirit. Thus, the Father is God, the Son is God, the Holy Spirit is God, and yet there are not three gods, but one God. The Father was neither made nor created, nor begotten, 
The Son was neither made nor created, but was alone begotten of the Father. The Spirit was neither made nor created, but is proceeding from the Father and the Son. And in this trinity, no one is before or after, greater or less than the other, but all three persons are in themselves co-eternal and co-equal. And so we must worship the trinity in unity, and the one God in three persons. This creed screams of contradiction, and was treated as such by critics. Some think it goes wrong, but are unsure as to where, and others simply reject it. The Athanasian Creed bears a strong resemblance to our modern-day Trinity doctrine, but I have no doubt in my mind that this doctrine will move further away from what it once was. Charlemagne's Court, circa 810. Many of us know about Charlemagne through popular cartoons and movies, but his real impact in church history is seldom talked about. Charlemagne was king of the Franks, king of the Lombards, and the emperor of Rome. In fact, he had united much of Europe, but this was no easy task. He held a council to discuss multiple issues that had been separating the Eastern and Western churches. One of these issues was the pesky little addition to the Nicene Creed, the double procession in the Trinity of the Spirit from Father and Son, which had taken its cue from Augustine's writings. It was Charlemagne's court that encouraged this development, in fact, it was encouraged so much by Charlemagne's court and the Latin West that they started placing in their text the Johannine Comma. The first known manuscript to include it comes from this era, and it makes sense that Charlemagne's court had something to do with it. Aquinas, circa 1270. We now reach the medieval era in the time of Thomas Aquinas. Aquinas was a Catholic priest and one of the most notable theologians of his day. Many atheists know him because of his terrible but incredibly famous five arguments for the existence of God, but we're not here to talk about his arguments for that. Aquinas had a very complex and intricate view on the Trinity. Just as the early church, he defined the Trinity by the relation of each being to the other, but in a very different way. God is pure act. That is, he has no potentialities of any kind. God is also utterly simple, with no distinct parts, properties, or actions. We may truly say, though, that God understands and wills. These divine processes are reflective relations, which are the persons of the Trinity. The word eternally generated by God is a hypostasis, what Aristotle calls a first substance, which shares the essence of God, but which is nonetheless relationally distinct from God. The persons of the Trinity, as they share the divine essence, are related more closely than things which are merely tokens of a kind, like identical twins. But he seems to hold that none are identical to either of the others Aquinas develops. For Aquinas, the relations paternity, sonship, and spirithood are real and distinct things in some sense in God, which constitute and distinguish the three persons of the Trinity. The persons are distinct as to their relations, but not distinct as to their essence or being. In what real way would these things be different, though? Aquinas argued that would just be modalism. This is, more or less, the end of the heated debate on the Trinity doctrine, but it wasn't fully done evolving into what it is today. Today. Circa. Today. Today brings us two kinds of Christians, those who know they can't understand the Trinity, and those who think they understand it but really don't. In fact, although they'd be horrified to hear it, many Christians sometimes behave as if they believe in three gods, and at other times, as if they believe in one. Today's Trinity is this, the idea that there is one God who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit means there is exactly one God. The Father is God, the Son is God, the Holy Spirit is God, the Father is not the Son, the Son is not the Holy Spirit, and the Father is not the Holy Spirit. Another way of explaining it is that there is exactly one God. There are three really distinct persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Each of the persons is God. The Trinity is not three individuals who together make up one God. The Trinity is not three gods joined together, and the Trinity is not three properties of God. The truth is, the Trinity is a mysterious doctrine. It was destined to become one from the very beginning. Thank you for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe. Check us out on Facebook and Twitter, and if you really love us, please consider supporting us on Patreon. Check out our new website, and we'll see you next time.